Hello. Hey, everybody. How are you today? How many people do I have in chat? I see just a few because Justin was really late getting it up. He's blaming either my dog or the weather. I'm not sure which one. I don't think we ever concluded which one we were going to blame. But hi, we're here now. We're here to talk about more Steel NMM. Yay, there you go, Taz Lynch. <laughs> There's a Justin face meme. I didn't know there was a Justin face meme. Oh, there is. Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ed's nya nya antlers are, are, I think, a little bit better, but I'm, I'm kind of pleased that there's also a Justin face me. Right. Hello. Hi, John. Are you all live? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see it on Twitch. We just went live. We had some technical issues with the camera. Oh. Okay. Right. Yes. But we're going to blame the weather or Kiri or Ron. We haven't decided which. Maybe we'll put up a multiple choice poll. I still wish to blame. <laughs> Hello, Coops. Hello, Twisted Oma. Hello, Robin. Hello, Rings. Hello, Avrilina. How are you? I am okay this morning. I, I, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty okay. Pretty okay this morning. We're going to do some chain mail. Chain mail is uh, Ron, of course. That's your choice. See, that's the correct choice, Twisted Oma. At one point, there was much uh, talk about actually putting that in the employee manual that when in doubt, it was always Ron's fault. Um, then it kind of transitioned to whichever employee had left us most recently. It was their fault, you know, but... In general, I think it's Ron's fault. It's a far better choice. Because then way, that way you always have somebody to blame. All right. Hello, hello. Hey, Jacob. How's it going? Oh, and we're being hosted by Art of Mike Disney. I swear he stalks us. Maybe switch to minicam? Sure. Switch to minicam. Let's do some stuff. Ronning man. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> Ronning man. <laughs> Everybody post theirs. Yeah. All right, so we're going to do some chain mail today. I'm kind of on the kind of on the straight to business side today because if I want to cover a bunch of stuff for you guys, we kind of have to be. Um, so we've got our NMM. I have uh, it's a little bit blue on the camera today. Sorry about that, um, but uh, it is like cloudy gray base coat, and we will be using the same colors that we used yesterday for steel NMM, which is the new triad that came out with the Bones for Kickstarter, which is very useful. Ah. Moonstone Blue also makes a good base coat for uh, white, by the way. It's just dark enough. It has some blue in it, so for a pure white. Uh, doo -doo. Yes, much NMM. I even thought about doing a third day of NMM, but that might be like going overboard drunk with power, you know, what Justin usually is. So he's still messing with my camera as we speak. So if things start to shift and get a little weird, we know that it's not necessarily Ron we have to blame. Ah. Uh, do, do. Hello, Scott Beal. Hey, Iggy. All right, so pretty much I'm going to start by just blocking in where my shadows are. And my shadows are wherever the light is not going to fall. So I usually will put my miniature under a light source here. Maybe I can get this light source to function that way. There we go. Kind of. It's hard to see through the sword. There's what we did yesterday, by the way. Go and catch the VOD. Um, so you can see there's a dark shadow right under his rump. There's also a dark shadow up here under his shoulders, and that's what I'm going to block in with my carbon gray. My carbon gray is a little thick right now, though, so I'm probably going to thin it down to about a 2 to 1 paint to water. I do want it to be dark still, because I need that contrast for the NMM to look reflective. Now, the thing about doing chain mail, guys, is that you're not painting every little link, which should cause a collective sigh of relief um, for everybody. And... Uh, the reason you're not is just that usually when you're dealing with very small metal surfaces, you're painting them as a mass uh, because that's the way that the light's going to hit them. The lights, I mean, it is going to hit every little individual scale if you got close to it. But when you're standing back from something and essentially looking at a 28 millimeter is like standing across half a football field from somebody. Um, when you're looking at something far distant, you're just going to see how the light hits a, a space like this in mass. And then as you get closer and closer and closer, then you can see the individual highlights on each scale and the individual shadows. But we are painting as if we are far away. Ha! Huh. Did you really? There's a summon an ritual? What level is it? I hope it's like, you know, like a zero level cantrip. Well, wait, maybe I don't because then everybody would summon me and then I would be very busy and I'm already too busy. I'm just going to get some uh, gray together to uh, blend this in a little bit and continue working. I'm going to do a little bit of wet blending just to set this up quickly. Set up a shadow, kind of blend it into the upper, upper area. If there's actual detail 
to define where the shoulder blades are. I might work with that, like putting a strip of dark down the middle there. Um, level nine. <laughs> level nine, so only like the highest level uh, Ann fans can summon me. Uh, nope, Cybestorm, I just didn't have a lot of chat this morning. I didn't have a lot of chat in me. I was just like, you know what, let's just get to it. Because uh, essentially, uh, to get through everything I want to cover for you guys today, uh, it's going to take a while. So I wanted to not, uh, not fiddle around a bit too much at the beginning. I wanted to just get into it. So I've only just started shading this area, and I'm trying to find the right level of shadow for the rump of the orc. I'll just call it his rump. And yeah, wherever you see little divots, uh, like here, there's a definite crease where his leg goes. Uh, you want to shadow those a bit too. With chainmail, you can always adjust and bring it back, uh, back up if you want it to. So, <laughs> level nine for art emergency. <laughs> That's good. Painting emergency. Summon Anne. All right, I need to thin that down a little bit too, a little bit thick. When you have a base coat, you can thin your paints quite a bit and still wet blend because you're not worrying about coverage as much. And I find that they do blend a little better when wet, so. Hey, men have just as much secret Cybestorm. Don't even give me that. Like, guys are pretty good at being close-mouthed about stuff too, just like us. I'm not gonna, not gonna buy that. I know plenty of men with dark secrets, and they're very good at keeping them. Do you have any dark secrets, Justin? Um, or does Paul know them all? <laughs> no, no, Paul is one of them. Uh, <laughs> but no, no. I think the only dark secrets I have are the, uh, the exposure problems I have with these cameras. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. hey, so he has exposure problems. You all heard it live here. Yes, I have problems exposing. And I'm going to leave it there. That's spoken it. spoken like a man who actually has dark secrets, but has no intention of telling any of you what they are. And figured it out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, actually, really, I don't think I have any crazy Oh, dark congratulations secrets. on the new job, Ferrissian. You don't have any, yes, like, really congrats. dark secrets? So, okay, so what I'm doing here, let's talk about a little bit what we did yesterday, and then I'm going to relate it to what I'm blocking in here extremely roughly. So, all right, for our sword, we got a little bit overexposed up here with our paint bottles, but you guys can see the colors pretty well. We're using carbon gray, moonstone blue, and pure white. Ah, oh, dears. There. And then they do not want to show you themselves. But, ah, and the orc wants to jump off. He's like, I'm done. All right, so what we did yesterday is we discussed where the light is coming down, you've got a lighter surface in general. Doesn't mean it doesn't have any variation from shadows, but it does. it is overall lighter. Where the light is falling, there's going to be a point where it cuts away from your eye, like this upper edge turns into a lower recessed edge, where the shadows would start, essentially. And on that point, you will have your brightest highlight, because that's where the light is really reflecting back at your eye, where that surface starts to curve. Right under your brightest highlight, you have a dark shadow. Th putting these two right next to each other are what makes the surface look shiny. And then you're bringing your dark shadow up to a reflection, which is the reflected light bouncing back up at the underlying metal surface. You don't see this on a dull surface necessarily like cloth, but you do see it on a very shiny surface like metal. And this under reflection is what gives you reflective. Metal is both shiny and reflective, so you need both to make it look like metal. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, Kuroniko, give yourself some... Uh, some cred there. These is this is not this this hard. I think you can I think you can replicate. I believe in you. All right. So what we're doing here then is much the same. I figured out where my shadow was first. My brightest highlight is going to be right where the the butt <laughs> cuts uh, starts to go down into the shadow. So my brightest highlight is going to be here. But I need to make this entire upper surface lighter. Um, then I've got the dark shadow, and then I'm bringing it back up down here toward the bottom edge, which is going to get a lot of reflected light, and here on the underside of the leg, also going to get some reflected light. Um, right now everything is the same highlight, which is something I'm going to change very shortly. But we're using thus the same principles. We're just choosing to paint each of these masses instead of painting individual rings. Um, one way you can, if you want to do a quick shade over everything to bring out the ring details and you don't want to rely on highlights, by the way, guys, you can put a real light black wash over this. Um, it won't hurt, and then you're just going to be painting over it. 
The thing is, though, when you're doing what I'm doing and painting, you know, block painting, uh, you're going to cover up the stuff that you shaded right away. So sometimes I'll just rely on my shadows and highlights uh, and then do a light, light side brush over the top of like a, the, light, the lighter gray to bring out everything. In fact, maybe I'll do that right now. Let's see. Where's a good brush for that? Um, I need a lighter gray. I'm going to mix it from my existing gray. My existing medium gray is not actually cloudy gray because I want some blue in it for it to look more natural. So it's actually about six drops of moonstone and one or two drops of carbon gray. And I actually need more moonstone for it to be a good light gray. So I'm going to add some moonstone to it, pop a bit of white in it. Also, uh, Sipstorn had a, a comment that, uh, I feel like you could probably help with. Oh, really? Uh, Sipstorm said that what takes Anne a few minutes takes me an hour. It doesn't look as good, and I question if I should ever paint again. <laughs> no, 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 no. Guys, seriously, the only reason I do it faster is because I've been doing it for a long time. How the many only way. Thousands of hours, honestly, do you think you've spent? Like, thousands. Well, they say, you know, there's that 10,000 hour rule that um, who came up with it? Was it Malcolm Gladwell and Outliers? I think he was just quoting a study previously done. Um, that said that yeah, to achieve true mastery in something, you must put in 10,000 hours. I actually disagree with that. I think it's a lower number, and I think the, the difference is made by how intentionally you practice. Um, like if you, if you go into, into a day just painting, or if you actually kind of try to be conscious of what you're doing and get better. Um, so I think you've been doing a lot less than that. That said, I've been painting to get better, I would say I've been working on since about 96. So 24 years? Yeah, there you go. But that's why I'm so fast, guys. And But I've been, fa I've been at this level for a while. Remember that also. Um, so it's not like it took me all of those years to get to this level. I mean, I've been winning. I went from, uh, from block painting Warhammer to winning Golden Demons, which is a national award, winning a Silver Demon, in six years. Right. So essentially... It, and, it, and it wasn't constant practice. You know, I had school and, you know, a boyfriend and, you know, games and stuff going on that took away from my painting time. What made the difference is intentional practice, is essentially saying, okay, I'm going to paint this area as good as, as well as I can, and I'm going to kind of, you know, take note of, like, how thin my paint is, what brush I'm using, all that sort of thing. Um, it's identifying your weaknesses and then intentionally attacking those. Yeah, right. Or just, or, or even identifying things you really like to do and trying to really excel at them because that every too. mini painter has that. Uh, we all have stuff that we're really good at that we love to do, and every time we do that, we reinforce how good we are and get a little bit better. So, like right now, freehand is probably where, like, I'm really good at it, um, but I could still put in practice and get better. Uh, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, it's just in, understand that it will take you a while. But if you don't put in that practice, if you just give up, you're never going to get there. So don't expect, we all have these huge expectations, and part of it's our current society that we live in and what it feeds us, uh, that we need to be awesome at something in order to persevere with it. This is not true at all. And that myth is probably responsible for more people not, you know, self-actualizing than any other because it's, it's poisonous. It gets in your head and it convinces you you must be awesome. If you're not awesome, obviously you weren't meant for this and that, that's just rankest BS. It's just, I hate that mindset. Um, it's not true at all. When I started mini painting, my stuff looked just as bad as any of yours and it had, you know, I dry brushed a Chaos Hound and I still have him actually. Uh, he's my oldest model, the Chaos Hound. The dry brushed Chaos Hound is my oldest model that I still own uh, that uh, that shows my earlier painting progression. Um, I mean, I did tiger stripes on him because freehand, right? But it's still a pretty bad model. Um, and before that, I did even worse models. <laughs> so, and I had an art, art background, remember this, so I should have had a leg up, right? Um, but you can't let that discourage you. You should find things to like in your current work and you should always keep your past work so that you can have a measure of how far you've come because it's easy to think you haven't progressed until you look at an older piece and go, oh, I actually did much better on these eyes, or hey, this hair looks a lot better, or the highlights here are a lot better. You know, give yourself room to applaud yourself too. That's another thing our society is terrible at. Not only does it tell us we must be perfect out the gate, but it also tells us a self-congratulation is like selfish or arrogant or whatever. No, if you do something and you've improved, be proud of it. Why not? It's kind of like when you do your workout pictures. Like, yeah. This is where I'm at at week one. This is where I'm at at week two. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you, you mean you don't go into the gym expecting to lose 40 pounds in one day. 
Um, well, well, some people I, do, and I they don't do. stick with it. <laughs> I, I would actually counterpoint to that uh, argument. I would actually argue that you go into the gym every single time, hoping to lose forty pounds in one day. And if you do that every every time, you're gonna you're gonna give it one hundred and ten percent. You're not going to die. I <laughs> I, well, okay. So now we need was, to differentiate. Uh, yeah. Now, now we differentiate uh, having a attitude that's focused on your goal versus expectations, right? Because that's different. Like, you don't really expect to, to no, lose 40 no, no, pounds no. in a day, but you definitely know that that's what you're fighting for and you right. visualize it. And it, so it keeps you coming. It gives you, gives you, makes you give it your all every time you, you try. Right. There's no half, And not be half disheartened. Right. There's and no not disheartened. be disheartened. If you don't make it, you didn't expect to make it, but you know that you progressed. So Correct. painting for painting's sake, guys. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm in the, I'm in the big truths uh, mental zone today. Because I think that it, this is one of the things that frustrates me the most about our hobby is just this, uh, this inclination, this, uh, our society in general, this inclination that we must be perfect and that there's a lot of pressure on us to be perfect and that it's, you know, and yet at the same time, we're all supposed to be completely humble and not, you know, um, admit that we are proud of our progress. I get frustrated. Part. Yeah, well, Collins, it suits you. Did you ever really try, though, to be honest? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I don't think you did. Tried it a solid bronze work. That's impressive, Karniko. Carnifexes are not for the faint of heart, and to paint one six times is pretty impressive. Um, do do be aware. Um, something I do kind of believe in, though, is that you got to eventually stop and move on to another model. Like, I do know somebody who repainted the same model, uh, like, four times, and I eventually told him, stop, get a new model, because... Uh, you can only learn so much from each model. So the more different things you paint, the more you're expanding your overall skill set. Uh, and so, yeah, you can learn a lot from that Carnifex and its various pieces and for a certain number of iterations, but there will come a point where you get diminishing returns, where you've painted the same surface so long that you don't uh, enhance any new skills. So let's see here. False belief that you must be born with a talent in order to be good at something. If you don't have this talent, you'll never be great at something, therefore you shouldn't waste your time doing it. Yes, totally false belief. Yes, d JWG. Absolutely that. Times a thousand. Yeah, it's practice. I mean, what separates very successful people from not successful people is usually perseverance and focus. Except for, for Collins. He's just focused on being awesome and it works for him. I like finger painting. <laughs> I like everything I can do. <laughs> I'm going to highlight a little bit down here. All right, so let's talk about what we've set up so far. Cool, Everlina. I'm glad that you are be able to see uh, improvement. Those are, those are good, good to practice on because the detail is big and clear, but there's still a lot of different surfaces, and uh, there's room to like work, and, and they have similarities, but they also have differences. So actually, painting a set of high rollers is a pretty good idea for improvement. Yeah, no expectations. Like, seriously, just go for it. Yes, and being willing to, and understanding you're not perfect and being willing to make mistakes. Exactly. Yeah, Riot, it can be. It depends on the figure. If it's a really big, complicated figure, I think you could still learn, you know, on the third try. Um, but, yeah, you do, you do run the risk of... Uh, losing perspective because you already are so familiar with the model. I think maybe if you repainted it three times, but you waited like six months before each redo. Um, but in that case, I would definitely like get a new figure of the same type and paint it so that you have your, your three different times that you painted the figure separated by six months between each. I think that would be very enlightening. Oh, thank you for the sub, Daff. Daff All right. Do, do, do. All right, so here we are. So as I was talking about, we want our brightest highlight right at the point where the surface cuts away and starts to descend into shadow. For burnished or interrupted surfaces, you may find that you can't really put your bright highlight right next to your dark shadow. Like it doesn't feel quite right and that's okay. Um, but you want to get close to it because that, that contrast is kind of what... Essentially, the, more, the less um, mirror bright and the more shiny, or more, sorry, more burnished surf, uh, surface is, you know, the more dull the metal is, the more you will see a blend between your brightest highlight and dark shadow. But the uh, opposite uh, of this, of course, is sky earth metal, which is essentially meant to mimic chrome, which is the most mirrored or, or shiny surface, and there you have an extremely harsh demarcation line. So... 
So there we go, brighter shadow, or brighter highlight, shadow, and then you can see I'm starting to bring up this area toward the belt a bit. And the reason for that is the belt is going to reflect a little light, um, and this uh, underside is still going to get some reflected light back up from the environment. So I won't bring it up as much as I do here. The brightest highlight is still going to be on the shoulders and on the rump. Um, and there might be a little highlight here uh, just because this edge is flaring out. Not only is it getting bounce back light, but because this lower edge of chainmail is, is uh, coming out, it's probably going to get some real direct light on it as well. So we're doing that. Let's just put in that more of that under reflection under the shoulders and see if we can show you guys what we mean. And here I'm using side brushing. I don't want to fill in the, uh, the holes between the links. I want to keep that three dimensionality. So I'm just lightly brushing with the side of my brush across the surface to pick up detail. It's kind of like dry brushing, it's just a lot more controlled. I want to bring up that highlight a little bit more. A little bit more up here. There. I want to it kind of like shape this surface a bit. Now I want to go up even higher. But I don't want to go up all the way, so I'm still going to mix a little bit of my gray into my white and uh, moonstone at this point. Let's see, and I just want to hit just a little bit down here. Let's see, that's coming up a bit. And notice that all of my um, all of my shadows between the links don't have to be black. Like here, it's just a medium gray, but it's still reading as a lighter surface. You know, down here I actually did paint in uh, dark and it did go down in the cracks, so that is reading correctly. Let me see here. Yeah, that's not bad. I'm still not too happy with the way this area is shaped. So I, essentially I might troubleshoot a bit, see if I can... Uh, make it read a little bit better. Maybe my shadow is still too dark, in which case I'm going to brush really lightly over the whole surface, bring it up just a little bit, let the underlying colors speak. There we go, that's a little bit better. Letting the under, underlying colors speak for the um, brightness or darkness of the, uh, lightness or darkness rather, of the surface. Yeah, that's starting to blend in much better. Uh, when you're painting, do you, when sometimes with the brush does it uh, Mini Painting Studio, you are trolling me, you silly. <sighs> Give him a troll star. Like, we, we need to have a troll icon that we put on people who ask, like, really confusing questions. <laughs> um, uh, Cybstorm, there, you can, you can kind of see that the shoulders are up here under the chain mill. It's real, like, light. I have accentuated it because I want that suggestion, because the musculature is so clear out here. In truth, you probably wouldn't see too much under a sheet of chainmail, but you probably would see a little bit. I probably have over-accentuated it a little, but I kind of like how it looks, so, you know. Yeah, you better give me a Purple Heart Mini Painting Studio. You better. I guess I'll forgive you. Especially so early. I've only had one glass of tea. Come on. And I'm trying to, like, be coherent and teach non-metallic metal. Respect here. Let's see here, what do I got? I want to bring up this area a little bit. And here I'm just, again, I'm using a real light brush. I want to blend this in just a little bit. It's, it's showing much darker on the camera than it is in person, but I want it to look right for you guys. So I'm going to side brush just a little bit to blend in a little bit. Now we're starting to see it. So that's getting a lot better. Boo, I need more tea. Yeah, I do, for sure. I have tea downstairs, but I try not to like overload in the morning. I try to save some of my tea for uh, the afternoon since everybody has kind of a slump during that time. Yeah, that's not dry enough. Do be aware that you don't want a lot of paint on your brush when you side brush. You don't want it to just dry as a dry brush, but you do want it not to go down the cracks. So if you look at it and it feels to you like maybe you've got too much paint, do listen to yourself. All right, so there we go, more or less. Looking okay. Yeah, that's decent. I probably, I could, like I said, the shadow is much darker here on the camera than it actually is in person. So in person, I might actually go and uh, darken that shadow just a little bit more. But it looks, I want it to look right on the camera. So we'll just light it a little bit more. Yeah, it's getting there. So that's kind of, that's, that's close to it. So I can make it better. Hi, Mavewin, thank you for subbing. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mini Painting Studio, for the endorsement of my Patreon. I really appreciate it. I have a lot of fun there. I'm planning some really cool stuff for this month. I'm kind of excited. Okay, I'm very excited. For my uh, $5 level, I think I'm going to tackle Verdigree this month. Colors to use for Verdigree and Metal Tarnish. I think it's going to be fun. But anyway, onward and upward. So I'm pretty happy with that. that so that, that's a basic idea of how to do chainmail. Now, stuff on the front like this, guys, so easy. Just shadow right under your... Um, Wherever you've got a crack, like here, here there's a little bit of, an, of a recess. There, there's going to be darker because it's under the breastplate. Like little, little fringes of chainmail like this are so easy. Shadow, 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 shadow. Wherever you see a little, a little crease or a divot, throw in that carbon gray. Bring it up a bit. And then all you need to do really is highlight out toward the bottom edge. Uh, because that's like on in this case this leg is extended so it's going to get more light so you highlight you know higher there you pick out the folds that stick out because they're going to get more light so just a little bit of a highlight like on top of that and uh, the edges will be lighter because they're being pushed out um, by the underlying cloth and everything like that and they're going to get light bounced back from the environment so pardon me while I clean these up a little bit so then you just pretty much highlight out toward the edge, and you're great with, uh, with chainmail. That's how chainmail can be so easy with NMM. I mean, obviously it's easy with metallics too, right? But, but it really is so very simple with NMM. And it looks good. Uh, that is, yeah, Koops, um, uh, Valandar has got it right. If it's a painted armor, it would actually, like a painted shield or painted wood lacquer armor, uh, it would actually, you'd paint it like paint and you probably would chip the edges or whatever. Um, but, uh, if you're working for like a, like some sort of futuristic metal that would be colored, um, or glazed with like see-through enamels or da -da -da -da, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yes, you would essentially find colors that would use, I don't know if I've done a colored NMM lately. I used to like to do dark blue steel for vampire armor. I thought it looked fantastic, especially with red cloth. Um, but I haven't done one of those in a long time. Uh, but yeah, you'd use the same rules. Uh, you'd always go up to pure white. You'd figure out what color your shadow is going to be. Um, you could introduce, with colored metal, it's a lot harder to introduce other colors into it. Like if you look at a car when it's like out, say, in a sunset or something, or it's near a neon sign or, or something where it's reflecting the environment, um, you'll find that the colors are muted. Like a red car, the colors won't show up as well um, because the surface is red, so that's acting, that's reacting with um, the colors that it's trying to reflect. So you won't necessarily see like sky color in a red metal, um, but you might see other things. So that's uh, really, if you're gonna show color around like reflected color from the environment it's best to do steel gold can be um hard but it totally is doable because gold you can always introduce greens and browns pretty easily um it tends to go a bit greenish when you try to introduce sky however which is why it typically does not read blue um, if you look at a gold piece of jewelry out under the sky it might look a little brassier but it typically will not reflect blue Um, Nox Geek. So it's two different techniques and they both have advantages. Yes, it is why you have metallics, but on a small model, sometimes metallics don't read very well because essentially uh, you're, you're such a small scale that it's really hard for all of these details to show up when you use metallics. You can paint them with shading and highlighting, but that is, at that point, you're using about the same techniques that you're using with, uh, with NMM. Like, essentially what it comes down to, painting at this small scale, we have to artificially enhance our highlights and shadows. Since metallics, when you just throw them on, don't do that, like they're just like there, um, they can look weird or off scale or not quite right until you shade and highlight them. People who are photographing their models like uh, 
people like like for Reaper, right? If we need to put a model up online to showcase it, or, or people who are painting for competition who expect to take really good photos, or just people who want to do like a special stylistic effect. Like maybe I do want to introduce colors from the fantasy environment around the model. Uh, I couldn't do that with metallics nearly as easily because the metallics are going to reflect, you know, what's actually there. Uh, and I have no control over that reflection or the highlight. But with NMM, I could suggest blue of the sky in some of these surfaces that are pointed up toward the supposed sky you know it's a lot easier to do that you can also totally control your highlights and shadows with nmm which means that that photos much better um, you're not fighting you know you can you can do things like draw the viewer's eye to a particular place by putting a shiny highlight there you know things like that so and as Valandar says, you can mix the two and shade and highlight and get kind of the best of both worlds with demi metallics, or as some people call them differently than demis these days. I don't know what the current terminology is for that, but uh, but yeah, so they both work. I personally feel that true metallics work a lot better on bigger models because you're not fighting that scale interpretation um, so much. So they actually look correct. They read correctly on a larger model, in my opinion. Uh, I like NMM a lot for smaller models because especially when you have small details on a 28 millimeter model, making like a little complicated piece of jewelry read correctly can be very difficult um, when you're using metallics on a very small model. So I like NMM because then I can make sure that all those little tiny details show up. If you look at um, an earlier lesson from, I think it was the first week of Pro Tips, I was doing a, a staff that was a very intricate braided pattern, one of the models that we, was one of our monthly giveaways uh, on an Elven Mage. And her little braided pattern, you'd never be able to get it to show up that sharp with regular metallics. It, it looks, uh, it's far easier to bring out all of the little details on it um, with NMM. So those are some of the reasons. Uh, it's always a big debate, and honestly, in the painting hobby, the fashion comes and goes as to which one is on top or more popular. And it's usually also regional. Like, I find that when NMM is big in America, it's usually true metallics in Europe and vice versa, uh, at least from what I've seen. Um, thank you, Coffee Nerdery Beer. I was pretty happy with it. I think I needed to uh, bring it up a little or uh, tune it a little bit more, but... Yeah, um, dioramas, uh, NMM can be amazing. I find that, that with OSL, with other source lighting, that's where dioramas really come into their own because you need that backdrop usually to get it to read correctly. I do think you can highlight NMM to be effective from more than one viewing angle. I have done it. I mean, usually most minis viewing angles, you know what their viewing angles are. This guy has a front viewing angle and a back viewing angle. You're probably not going to look at him from that angle. Um, so if you know the main viewing angles of the model, you should be able to make the model look correctly and read correctly at all of the important angles for it. Totally ask questions, Knox Geek. And I don't mind covering stuff I've covered before on this show because we always have new viewers. And so asking these questions is really good. It lets me, uh, lets me talk about important stuff. So cool. Uh, so breastplate. I don't know if I'm going to have time to get through this. I might have to do this a little bit tomorrow. What time is it, Justin? It is 11.40. Oh, oh, I don't know. Well, I can at least do the basics. I might come back with more NMM tomorrow and show you guys like the breastplate in detail and um, also do some like uh, rusting and stuff if you are up for that. That would make it kind of NMM week, which I didn't originally set out to do, but as Justin pointed out to me the other day, NMM is always a very popular topic. So yeah, it probably isn't bad to have three NMM sets. Uh, and that way, when it goes up on YouTube, you guys should just be able to watch them all in a row very easily. Whereas if I put a lot of space between my NMM episodes, it would uh, be a little harder to do that. So maybe I'll do that. Maybe we'll do some rusting, because this breastplate just screams that it needs some rust and, uh, and stuff, weathering. And that would be fun. We could play with it, make it really awesome. I could talk a bit about how I would weather it with metallics as opposed to weathering it with NMM because they would definitely be different. I'm going to just uh, shade underneath these little rivets here. Once again, even though they cast a shadow, um, we need to add more shadow because this is a smaller model. So it does not really cast its own shadows realistically. Uh, and I just kind of lined around the plates real loosely just to set them off from each other. That lining will get blended in. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, rust on TNM uh, 
I think because uh, there are a few people who are very good at it, Valandar, and, uh, and I think they all do it a little bit differently. Um, but I would be happy. I mean, I've done it. Um, it actually was one of the most successful things that I learned from Kirill's seminar. Kirill Kenev, uh, who is a Russian painter, goes under the yellow one as his uh, moniker on Simon, is uh, top level, possibly the best in the world at, uh, I would say, shaded metallics and uh, skin tones. He's amazing. He does work on busts for young miniatures uh, and paints a few other things here and there for people. Um, he does amazing work. I am a huge Kirill fan. He came here to do a workshop a few years ago, and uh, that's where I learned uh, how really to do some good weathering work on shaded metallics, and uh, I am forever grateful because, boy, I love doing it now. It's super fun. All right, there we go. Got our chips outline. That's another thing. If there are any chips or scratches that are sculpted into the armor, kind of put a little guideline to remind yourself that they're there. You can make a little, use a little dark slash. There's a chip right here. There, and we've got little chips coming down here. That way I won't forget about them. What do we got? Thanks, Achilles. Yeah, Useless Wizard Kirill's is amazing. He's wonderful. He does cheat a little bit. He, uh, from time, he, time to time, he will actually uh, import the 3D render of the bust into a, uh, into a program so he can actually light it uh, using the program, and then he just paints what he sees. <laughs> The next stream today is three, and it's me again, Ferrisian, and we're going to be battling the white dragon. Um, I started with sticks, actually, and it's just pretty much base coated in six purple right now, Fainity. Um, although it's starting, the highlights on the camera kind of look like runic purple, and that is what I would use to highlight the purple. Is sticks purple is uh, 9423, and runic purple is 9424 in Bones Line. I really love those purples. Yes, 3 p.m. is when I return painting dragons and chatting with y'all. And by then I should have had my second infusion of caffeine. So, you know, hopefully I will be a, a bouncier Anne. Not that I'm an unbouncy Anne right now, but yes. Uh, so let's actually block in our shadows on the breastplate at least. So looking at the way the model goes, I'm seeing when I, when I put it toward my light, I'm seeing more light falling on this side than on that side. Do you guys see that? So that's probably what I'm going to do. Um, and with the way the model is turned, it makes sense. The head is turning that way. Uh, and I probably want to highlight fall in like that. So that's what I'm going to go for. And you see that there is actually a demarcation line. There is kind of an indent. It's very subtle, but it goes down the front of each plate. So playing with the light and seeing that, you can also just choose to accentuate it more than it is. And I think that's what I'm going to do. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, yeah, the weather hopefully, well, it's very cold here in Denton today. <laughs> Reaper is my addiction. And you mean to say you don't like all 400? Actually, I love all 400 or so colors I have designed, Reaper. However, I definitely have favorite children. And I have one child that I hate, although now I have to take that back because it's my historically most hated color from the time I was a little kid. Um, but I've found a good use for it, thanks to Rhonda. So now I can't hate it anymore. Which is, by the way, mint green. All my baby furniture was mint green when I was little, and I have hated mint green <laughs> ever since I can remember. Is like I love all colors. I always, as a kid, loved all colors, but I hated mint green. But mint green is a fantastic highlight for any teal or greenish blue, so I have to take it back. Oh, I love yellow. Collins, that's my favorite color, is yellow. I love purple too. It's, it's a fight. It's a, usually a throwdown fight between purple and yellow for me, but I do. I have to privately admit that I love yellow. Mint green is uh, 9263? Yes. And it's essentially a pale phthalo blue. I'm just darkening up this uh, area here. Again, I'm just blocking it in. Please note, guys, um, you know, I'm not going to blend for my first part of this NMM. I'm really just blocking everything in. I want to make sure it looks right before I spend a lot of time blending it. So don't feel like you have to get your blending perfect out the gate on NMM, although in the end, the better you blend, the more realistic the metal will look. You do not have to start out that way. You can start out by just blocking. 
and that takes a lot of the stress out of it because then you're not necessarily criticizing yourself on your blending. You're instead just trying to make sure you get your highlights and shadows correctly in the right places so that the metal looks right. Um, unfortunately, the indentation in these uh, plates is a little bit off like from each from one to the next so it's not symmetrical which makes it look a little bit wonky so I may have to use some paint plastic surgery to adjust that and shove that over more a little bit more shove that over also the sharper I make this line like drawing that line down the middle the sharper this indentation is going to look um, if I wanted it to look like it was more just a gentle curve I would just blend from this into the next area. But if I use this sharp demarcation line, I'm sending a visual message that this is a shiny breastplate, one, and two, that there is a definite angle to it. Tarnished copper. Yeah, so every once in a while I make that mistake. Uh, chestnut gold is another example. Palomino gold is another example. Um, so tarnished copper actually, however, is not a mistake because it is part of a non-metallic metal triad. So it is actually meant to represent copper. Um, it's just not meant to be a metallic copper. So that it can confuse people who are not familiar with non-metallic metal. Um, however, since it was actually the NMM triad for copper, I did have to call it copper. Had no choice there. But there, yeah, there are other colors where I just use gold as a, as a color indicator rather than a type of paint indicator. And those were actually done pretty early in my existence as a Reaper or paint line designer. So those, like chestnut gold, definitely, if I had a chance to rename it, I probably would call it golden chestnut and golden palomino instead. Um, but yeah, in the copper case, it was meant to say copper because it is an NMM triad. That said, tarnished copper is one of the most useful gosh darn colors I've ever made and uh, has a lot of other uses outside of NMM. Doo -doo -doo. Let me see here. Glow effect on NMM. That's pretty easy. So easy, Rex. Essentially, just remember your, uh, your color here. Maybe I can actually do it. Uh, blue. Let's say that we've got a blue lighting effect. Boom. Why not? Because you can do the same thing on TMM, by the way. You just change the color of your highlight. You might need to mix it in with your uh, pearl white for your highlight, but you could totally do it. But essentially, the, the color that you use to highlight with on NMM or metallics is going to dictate what the color of the light hitting it is. Um, now, if I was assuming there was a big blue light right here or a glowing crystal or something, I would have to highlight everything with this same blue in order to carry that effect. But essentially, wherever my highlights go, I'd have to do use the blue. I'll totally paint over this for tomorrow, don't worry. But I wanted to illustrate this because it really is easy. It's just, it's much easier than you'd think but you've got to introduce that blue everywhere that your highlight's going to be. Then you bring that blue up to white because remember, metallics and non-metallics always have to come up to white. So I often, and this is the use for pearl white, by the way, for everybody kind of looking at pearl white, 9100 and scratching their head. Pearl white is meant to be a highlight color for all metallics. It works with almost everything we've got. So here, I'm going to bring it up a little bit more. So here I bring it up to up close to a, yeah, there. So you're going to use the same effect on uh, metallics. You're going to do the same thing. You're going to choose, say, your light color. You're probably going to underpaint it in pearl white, or you're going to mix a bit of it into your pearl white, or you're going to glaze it over. I would probably, I might glaze it over because that's really what the light is doing, right? It's kind of painting a color on top of everything and then it's reflecting back. So I might highlight up your, uh, your metals all the way up to pearl white, then choose your blue or your green or whatever you're using and glaze it over that. Um, Sophie Silver, it could not be used non-zero value, or it could be used in this case specifically, but not as a general highlighter because the metal flake in Sophie Silver is blue. It is not a neutral white. Um, that's why Sophie Silver is such a kind of a niche color. Um, it would be good for highlighting blue light if you wanted to use it for that, or blue metallics. You could use it to highlight our blue metallic and it would work really, really well with sparkling blue. But yeah, so kind of like that. 
And you have to follow the same rules with NMM. You, you have to, but you, you see the case, you see it, right? So the blue light is shining on the metal. Hey, speak of the devil and Rhonda appears. <laughs> I was just saying, Rhonda, I can't hate mint green anymore because you remarked on what a useful color it was at the, I think it was Sergio's uh, workshop when he was using it. And now I can't hate it anymore. It used to be my only color I didn't like. So yeah, so there you go. So you do that same thing with metallics. Yeah, Sophie Silver is, is a weird one. I, I wanted to put out just something cool and, and kind of novelty because, you know, it was a special color. I think it was Reapercon or whatever it was for. Um, and I do that sometimes. when And those colors, I really, um, I don't put them in a regular paint line because of their limited utility. Uh, when I want a color but it's kind of an oddball. I try to put it out as a special special release instead of uh, special edition instead of always in. Um, because then people can get confused if it's uh, like with the Sophie Silver. If it's in regular release, they might think that it's something other than what it is. But, but yeah, if you look close at Sophie Silver, you'll see that the flake actually does shift blue. It's, uh, it's very subtle because all of our flakes are made to appear more vibrant over a dark background. So when you put them in a paint that has white in it, you do not see the blue as much. So it is uh, quite visually deceptive unless you look closely. Hey, Chinner. Yeah, I've got back problems today too, Rhonda. Well, okay, I've got back problems all the time, but today is uh, annoying. I had to change the chair this morning and Justin laughed at me because I, I shrank. I made it go lower so that I would be a better posture here at the uh, painting table. It seems to have worked though. So I'm not, uh, not going to take it back. But if you all notice I shrank on the camera, that's why. I am actually shorter on camera today. Not that I'm a very tall person ever. White metallic 9100 pearl white Ellie Otter. All right, so yeah, da da da. So that's just basic. Tomorrow I'm gonna paint over this. Yeah, trying to keep good posture really does help. Um, I'm gonna paint over this with gray. We're gonna tackle the breastplate and rust tomorrow, I think. Um, if you guys want me to do rust effect on metallics instead, I can do that. I wonder, something tells me I covered that on my Patreon, but maybe I didn't. Maybe I didn't, huh, eh. Well, we can cover it here, we can cover it there, we can cover it everywhere. So, um, wrap up. What time is it, Justin? It is 11.54. Perfect. All right. Time for wrap up. Um, glad it helped, Rex. Any questions? Any comments? Any, you know, like crazy and trolling moments? I'm looking at you. <laughs> no problem, she's a gaming. I, I actually a... really look forward to my uh, my 11 a.m. stream with you guys. You want to give us a quick recap on what you did today? Sure, we did NMM Chainmail. Da, da, da. We put highlights and then our darkest shadow, and then we highlighted back up toward the bottom of things to show that they were reflective. We painted Chainmail in a mass because at a far distance, which is essentially what you're kind of looking at with a 28 millimeter figure, you would not see the highlights on in each individual link of the chain mill. You just see the light glancing off the whole area. And I kind of showed on the front how easy it was when you've just got a little fringe of chain mill coming down, you just pretty much shadow, and then you bring it up to a highlight out toward the edges and on the raised surfaces. And you can get a really nice looking effect. Uh, Mad Mardigan, we never do giveaways on the 11 a.m. and show, um, at least not yet. Justin and I are still kind of, you know, have like 2% of our brain cell activity kind of thinking about like what we might want to do. There is, however, a giveaway this afternoon. Yes, there are always the giveaways on the Ann, the Ann Afternoon Show, which is really just the Any Artist Who Wants to Crash It show, as Lovejoy, you know, uh, proved uh, last week. Um, but yeah, a Toolbox Regular, 3 p.m. Wednesday, does have giveaways. But Justin uh, right now doesn't want to get like buried under giveaways. So we are respecting his wishes. We would not want him to be buried either because we kind of need him to run these shows. Let's see here. Yeah, Bronda has a great, uh, great um, point in that at ReaperCon there are often no shows. So you can always like go to the classroom and see if somebody hasn't showed and then you know, buy your ticket and get in. 
Um, it does happen, especially on uh, Saturdays and Sundays, especially on Sundays, that everybody who paid for the class initially is like totally burned out and uh, we don't get all of our students. There we go. So yeah, um, that is what we did today. We are going to set up for the breastplate for tomorrow. I'm going to take off all my blue light, even though I like it. <laughs> I thought the giveaway was two hours of Anne's knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Good enough giveaway, right? And everybody gets that. All right. All right. We are ready to roll out of here. And I'm going to take a break and eventually eat lunch and get all fired up to come back and paint dragons. But I can't wait till these dragons are done. <laughs> Been painting these dragons for a long time. Next time I do this, if I do it again, if I do a prolonged project, I'm totally going to paint something much smaller, like one of our giants or something, where I can get it done in a couple months and it'll be like done done. Yes, the blue light is reflecting off the poster tack, exactly. Yes, it's dragon time this afternoon. Indeed, I will see you at three. All right. Be sure to catch us later. I'm going to go right. ahead and uh, start the raid here. Uh, who are we raiding? We're raiding a traditional sculptor. Someone's learning it. Oh. Um... It's interesting to see. He looks. I don't. I can't tell what he's sculpting, but uh, it looks fun. Super. So, Spread the love, everybody. Spread Stay the awesome. Reaper love. Yes. Um, keep being awesome. You bet. We'll see you at three. Bye bye. See you at three today, guys. <laughs>